Hello and welcome to our second virtual APA assessment community gathering to celebrate our wonderful student poster award winners. My name is Emily Shaw and I'm from Division 5 and I'm thrilled to be here today with my colleagues David McCord from Division 12, the assessment psychology section, and Laura Grandy from Division 40. At each APA annual convention, the assessment community hosts a breakfast, co-sponsored by various assessment organizations and our three divisions, where we come together to connect and honor students who have done outstanding research in the assessment field. The students share their posters with us, we congratulate them, present them with their awards, and while we don't have our usual food and coffee here for everyone today, we are thrilled to still be able to connect in a different way to honor and share the work of our 2021 Assessment Community Student Poster Award winners. David. Thanks, Emily. Uh, we want to just briefly recognize our sponsors this year. Uh, their willingness to provide the funding for the $250 awards for our three winners and for the award certificates is what makes this event possible. Their generous support allows us to recognize three very impressive research projects with students as principals, sophisticated, substantial projects that contribute meaning meaningfully to our field of assessment psychology. So we ask that you take just a minute to consider how important our publisher partners are in our assessment work. And we want to personally express gratitude to the individuals who served again this year as our contacts with these publishers Sarah Orzipa of MHS, Stella Rokablave of Riverside, Dr. Dave Hersberg of Western Psychological Services, and Vanessa Berenson of Pearson Assessments. Dr. Grande, would you like to introduce the winners? I very much would like to introduce the winners. So thank you, David. Uh, so we have three fabulous winners and I'd like to, to tell you their names and the titles of their posters. Um, the first poster that I want to tell you about is validation of the in-group colorism scale, ICS, with South Asians in the United States. And that poster was submitted by Nisha K. Bhatt from Lehigh University, and she represents Division 5. Our second poster is using cognitive interviewing methodology to refine and develop the CARS 2.0. And that was submitted by Juliana F. Ng from Palo Alto University, and she represents Division 12. And finally, an alternative approach to determine the validity of TOM scores. And that was submitted by Felicity Dodato from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and she represents Division 40. So we'll have you take it away, Nisha. Hello, I'll be presenting on the validation of the in-group colorism scale with South Asians in the US. I'm Nisha and I'm a grad student at Lehigh. I completed this study with Dr. Inman from Ohio State and Dr. Kasky from Lehigh. To start, colorism is a concept that privileges lighter-skinned individuals and disadvantages darker-skinned individuals. In the US, Colorism has roots with Black communities and has also influenced many other communities of color, including South Asians. For example, lower self-esteem and decreased body satisfaction are related to perceived darker skin with South Asian adults. However, limited research exists on in-group variability. Therefore, I used the in-group colorism scale, or the ICS, to examine evidence of reliability and validity with three South Asian generations, first, 1.5, and second generation. Since the ICS has been developed with a norming population of African-American individuals, I assessed if the ICS five-factor structure was a good fit for the data with a sample of South Asian adults. To do this, I recruited 283 South Asians living in the US who were aged 18 or older through a community and an MTurk sample. Consenting participants completed a 15 to 20 minute survey with demographic information, the ICS, and a social desirability measure. For my main results, I tested a hypothesized and an alternative ICS model, which was proposed by the scale authors. Both models have five latent variables or factors representing the five subscales, and each latent variable has four indicator variables or items. 
Figure one shows the hypothesized model with the five factors correlated, and figure two shows the alternative model with the hierarchical overall colorism factor. I conducted two confirmatory factor analyses and found that the correlated model was the best fit for the data. Given that the ICS retained the five factor structure with a sample of South Asian adults. Second, I found that the ICS had excellent reliability statistics. Third, I found that there was no significant difference between the three South Asian generations. And fourth, there was a greater endorsement to in-group colorism attitudes related to a higher likelihood of socially desirable responses. Finally, additional information can be found in the right-hand column about my study, as well as contact information. Thank you for watching. Hello, everyone. My name is Julianne Newton, and I am a doctoral student from Palo Alto University. It is my honor to present a poster titled Using Cognitive Interviewing Methodology to Refine and Develop the CARS 2.0 with the help of my colleagues, Esraya, Sam, and Dr. Julius Chu. Existing research has found cultural differences in suicide, but culture is inadequately incorporated in many standardized suicide risk measures. The Cultural Assessment of Risk for Suicide, abbreviated as the CARS, is the first measure developed to assess for culturally specific suicide risk factors. The CARS has demonstrated good validity and reliability, but our research team would like to further refine this measure to ensure that item wording is understandable and sufficient for minoritized individuals. As cognitive interviewing is a prominent method for identifying and addressing problems in survey questions, it is used in the present study to develop version 2.0 of the CARS to improve the cultural sensitivity and validity of items for ethnic, gender, and sexual minority adults. In this study, we assess an initial list of 147 CARS 2.0 items by conducting cognitive interviews with a diverse sample. Each participant was presented with items from a randomly selected factor of the CARS and asked to provide feedback on the domains of comprehension, information retrieval, judgment, response, and relevance. The results of our qualitative analysis revealed some areas for item adaptation. As shown in the graphs, issues with judgment were reported the most fr frequently, and issues with response relevance, comprehension, and information retrieval were reported less frequently, respectively. While the patterns of reported issues differed across the four factors of the CARS, we identified some common themes of issues. For example, some participants found that specific item terminologies may perpetuate systemic injustice, and others prefer more specificity in item wording. Some participants also convey the challenges in addressing minority stress within a framework of intersectionality. All in all, our research team was able to identify common themes of concerns that participants encountered when reading the initial pool of CARS 2.0 items. These findings will inform the retreatment, revision, and removal of existing items to develop a revised suicide risk questionnaire that is more culturally suited for diverse ethnic, gender, and sexual minority adults. This project also demonstrated the utility of cognitive interviews in assessing cultural content and measure refinement. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Felicity Dodato and I'm currently a master's student at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. And today I'm gonna to be presenting my poster titled An Alternative Approach to Determine the Validity of Tom's Course, which I've created along with Dr. Ford, Dr. Wang, and my mentor, Dr. Puente. Neuropsychological assessments can be used to evaluate the cognitive and emotional functioning of an individual, and the accuracy of these assessments relies on participants exhibiting their true capabilities. So when participants provide invalid responses or intentionally exaggerate those symptoms, results can be misleading and the validity of the assessment itself can be dramatically reduced. This intentional exaggeration of symptoms is known as malingering, which has become an increasingly prevalent problem within neuropsychology today. The test of memory malingering, or the TOM, is a popular performance validity test, which can be used to determine if a person is exhibiting symptoms consistent with genuine memory impairment. And while the TOM has proven to be highly sensitive to those that are deliberately faking or exaggerating, there is little to no explanation regarding the significance of using 45 as a cutoff score. And there is also extensive literature suggesting that a cutoff score of 45 is not the most effective. 
So this study aims to further investigate this traditional cutoff score of 45 by examining the scores obtained by a large sample of active duty military personnel. A total of 1,110 participants were referred for evaluation by military neurologists and medical officers. And after an initial clinical interview was conducted, the time was administered to participants within a neuropsychological blast battery, which contained 18 demographic variables and 15 tests. Participants then attended a follow-up session in which their results were discussed with the neuropsychologist. Scores from this sample range from 9 to 50, and on average, the majority of participants scored between a 45 and 50 on the top. More specifically, 31 participants received a 45, and 29 participants received a 44. Confidence intervals were also calculated for trials 1, 2, and the retention of the TOM, as well as for the average of all three trials. And for the lower bound, scores ranged from 43 to 47, where for the upper bound, scores ranged from 44 to 48. When using a cutoff score of 45, there's only one point that's going to separate those who received a 44 and those who received a 45 on the TOM, but their consequences will be much different. Using an absolute cutoff point does not provide the best way to detect malingering as it forces psychologists to put participants into different groups when only a few differences may actually exist between them. By using confidence intervals calculated from scores obtained by a large military sample, this would be a more effective way to interpret TOM scores. So for example, if a participant scores below the confidence interval of the trial, then it's likely that they're going to be malingering. But if they score within or above this confidence interval, it's likely that they are not. By moving away from using an absolute cutoff point to interpret TOM scores, this will allow for a more accurate and complete classification of malingering. And future research should explore the effectiveness of using confidence intervals with larger samples, as well as comparing the use of confidence intervals with cutoff points to determine their accuracy. Thank you. We'd like to thank our three fabulous students for sharing their work and we thank all of you for taking the time to listen and learn. We hope to see you in person at the APA Assessment Community Breakfast at the annual convention in 2022. And please, please keep those Division 5, 12, and 40 assessment-related student poster submissions coming. We look forward to hearing from our future award winners at the breakfast next year. Thanks, all. <laughs>